very fortunate to have a seasoned veteran of American engagement in the Arctic as the next speaker. David Balton has represented the U.S. in many major forums on Arctic affairs, often serving as the chair of international gatherings, before leaving the State Department to become a senior fellow at the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center. He was the U.S. ambassador charged with American policy related to oceans and fisheries worldwide. We look forward to hearing his ideas on how to go about, here's the title, Strengthening Governance of the Arctic Region. Over to you, David. Uh, thanks very much, David, and uh, good morning to everyone uh, listening in the United States. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. Yes, my presentation will be from the perspective of a, of a diplomat. I have spent a lot of time looking at the Arctic region uh, from a sort of a geopolitical context. Um, I recall yesterday, President Grimson spoke of uh, the Arctic as a place where two things are intersecting. One, uh, the issue of climate change, and he's certainly right. Uh, the Arctic is uh, sort of an epicenter of climate change and climate problems, but also of uh, competition among great powers. Um, what his description um, does, though, is it begs the question, looking to the future, will the nations of the Arctic, will the peoples who live in and care about the Arctic find ways uh, to cooperate with one another? to address the problems of climate change, and I would add the other pressing issues of the region, or are we uh, damned to compete and uh, have conflict with one another and uh, fail to address our mutual interests there? Um, excuse me, I move this forward. I don't normally like to put text on my slides, but uh, I did, in, I made an exception in this case. Here are two uh, famous quotes uh, one from years ago, Mikhail Gorbachev, as the Cold War was winding down and not long before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, gave a famous speech in Romance. He said the Soviet Union wants to radically lower the level of military confrontation in the Arctic. The Arctic, of course, had been um, a center of, uh, of conflict during the Cold War, but he wanted it to become a zone of peace. And for the most part, that vision was realized over the course of the ensuing years, at least until recently. And we heard about this too uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo on his way to the Arctic Council Ministerial Meeting in Rovaniemi, Finland, stopped off in Helsinki the day before and delivered uh, a different kind of message. He uh, described the Arctic as uh, becoming an arena for power and competition. He accused Russia of uh, territorial ambitions that can turn violent. Uh, he decried Chinese uh, uh, overreach in the Arctic. A good measure, he spoke of uh, a feud between the United States and Canada over the Northwest Passage. And the following day, for the first time in its history, the Arctic Council was unable to agree on a declaration to chart its course over the next two years, purportedly because the United States uh, would not accept language relating to climate change. And so where do we go from here? Is Secretary Pompeo's message um, sort of um, a prophecy for where we are headed, or is it an aberration? And are we going to return to a kind of cooperative international environment, environment for the Arctic? And to answer that question, I want to take us on a very brief tour of what has happened in the last couple of decades at the international level. An amazing array of institutions and arrangements have actually been put in place for the Arctic. We heard about some of these uh, in previous presentations. Um, probably the most influential and consequential uh, group in the Arctic is the Arctic Council created 25 years ago. Um, and it has dealt with environmental protection. It has uh, helped countries pursue sustainable development projects in the Arctic. And although it's not formally part of its mandate, the Arctic Council has helped to keep the peace in the Arctic. Indeed, it was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize not that long ago. Um, it has spun off a number of other institutions, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum maybe five years ago, the Arctic uh, Economic Council, uh, sort of private sector sister group for the Arctic Council created uh, also about five years ago. Other institutions, uh, part of the United Nations International Maritime Organization has been paying attention to shipping in the Arctic. 
IASC is the International Scientific Committee that's devoted a lot of attention to the Arctic. All of this has been um, as a result of a sort of cooperative environment that the Arctic has been able to achieve. And these institutions and arrangements have, I would say, given birth to additional cooperative activity. Critics of the Arctic Council often point to the fact that it does not have the capacity to adopt decisions that are binding on its members on the eight Arctic states. That is true. And a number of times in the past decade, those same states have felt the need to create binding rules among them to deal with mutual problems that they face. Well, the Arctic Council has found kind of workarounds three times in just the last 10 years. It created task forces to uh, negotiate new treaties among the eight countries. The first in 2011 uh, deals with search and rescue. In the Arctic, it was well understood that more people are coming to the Arctic. There are almost certain to be search and rescue incidents in the area. Each of the eight Arctic states are, well, they don't have sufficient capacity to deal with these types of problems. So perhaps by pooling our resources, by sharing data, by doing joint training and exercises, we can increase our search and rescue capabilities uh, in a joint way. That was the essence of this agreement signed in 2011 by Hillary Clinton on behalf of the United States and her counterparts from the seven other Arctic countries. Two years later, a kind of similar agreement was struck. Uh, this one to deal with the possibility of large scale marine oil pollution agreements. And here, Sergey is quite right. If there were a major oil pollution incident in the Arctic comparable to what happened in the Gulf of Mexico years ago, it would be much worse. And each of the eight Arctic states operating on its own does not have the capacity to deal with such a problem. But again, maybe by pooling our resources, joint training, joint exercises, we can improve our capabilities jointly. And that is what that agreement was all about. Um, a couple of years later, four years later, uh, a third agreement to come through the Arctic Council process uh, is in, uh, designed to enhance scientific cooperation among the eight Arctic states. And for those who might think that the United States under President Trump would not ever sign such a thing, well, they're wrong. President Tillerson signed this agreement on behalf of the United States in 2017. All three agreements are enforced. Another interesting thing is that the efforts to negotiate these three agreements were co-led in each case by the United States and Russia. In the case of the 2013 agreement, a third co-lead, Norway, joined. But it does demonstrate that at least the United States and Russia, despite serious conflicts about other parts of the world, about other issues, chose to compartmentalize the Arctic in a sense, chose to focus on what we have in common and work together in efforts to address serious problems. Outside the Arctic Council, two other binding agreements have been struck also just in the last 10 years uh, through the International Maritime Organization I mentioned earlier, uh, a new set of rules for strengthening uh, environmental security and safety of shipping in the Arctic region, also in the Antarctic region, came through the uh, IMO process and entered into force in 2017. And a final agreement, I was very much involved in this one as well, there is this large area in the center of the Arctic Ocean beyond 200 miles from any coastline, high seas area, the international lawyers call it. There has never been commercial fishing in the history of the world there because it's been covered by ice year round until now. Now a portion of that is open water for at least part of the year. And there was the prospect that large commercial fishing vessels might enter those waters and begin fishing before there was any scientific information to tell us what the effects of taking X tons of you know, Arctic cod or char from this part of the world's ocean would mean. And so after a bunch of years of negotiation, uh, some Arctic states and some non-Arctic states, you see their flags around this screen, signed an agreement in 2018, agreeing not to allow commercial fishing in this area for at least 16 years during which time there's also commitment by the same group to uh, study the area, to have a joint program of scientific research and monitoring to figure out 
whether a fishery or fisheries could take place in these waters on a sustainable basis. Uh, six Arctic countries have signed on to this agreement, US, Canada, Norway, um, Russia, um, Kingdom of Denmark on behalf of Greenland and the Faroe Islands, Iceland that I mentioned, plus China, Japan, South Korea, and the European Union. Uh, all 10 signed the agreement in 2018, nine of the 10 have completed the ratification process. We're just waiting for China to complete the ratification process for the agreement to enter into force. And China has said yet again, just last week, that it is intending to do so. There are no obstacles, political obstacles to its ratification. We have heard, um, and Sergey mentioned this again, that there are so-called territorial disputes in the Arctic. Um, I wish I had a dollar for every time this was mischaracterized uh, in the press or in um, events like this. Uh, and I think at least a minute to sort of put this in a little better context might be useful. Uh, we're only talking about seafloor under the ocean. There is no land territory above water that is in dispute, serious dispute anywhere in the Arctic. And what is happening in the central part of the Arctic Ocean is also happening in many other parts of the world ocean as countries are trying to figure out how far from shore their so-called continental shells extend. Well, they extend at least 200 miles under international law. And then if the seafloor meets certain tests, it can extend further still. And yes, in this area beyond 200 miles from any shore, uh, planes by five countries that surround this area will and do overlap. What happens when there are overlapping claims to seafloor? Well, maritime boundary lines are negotiated or sometimes adjudicated through international tribunals uh, to figure out which belongs to which. And in some cases, some neighbors in the, in the Arctic have already done so. The United States and Russia have a boundary line that separates the Russia's potential continental shelf claim from the U.S. potential continental shelf claim. There will be no overlap. Russia and Norway have a boundary line as well. Some of the other countries have not yet negotiated these boundary lines, including, I would add, the U.S. and Canada. We have a difference of view about where the boundary should be in the Beaufort Sea. But we are not going to war over these uh, differences of view. These issues will be solved. It will take a long time, but will be solved based on certain rules by lawyers, by geographers, by geologists. Uh, and we will have a resolution of these matters in some time in the future without the use of warships. There are issues about freedom of navigation in the Arctic through both the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route that you see here on this map. Um, and there is a potential for conflict over these. Um, the United States, for example, has a different view of the right of, in this case, non-Canadian vessels to pass through Canada's Northwest Passage. Canada takes a different view than the US. Russia has a different view than the United States, a number of other countries about the right of non-Russian vessels to sail through the Northern Sea Route. Uh, for the most part, these countries have agreed to disagree and Probably that will continue to happen. I don't see us going to war over these issues either. The real security challenges in the Arctic do relate to climate change. And I think now that uh, President Biden is in office, the United States will be returning to the table. We've already rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement. We will once again be happy to use the Arctic Council to try to deal with the climate and other environmental problems of the Arctic, I think we will see a toning down of some of the um, uh, confrontational messages like that of Secretary Pompeo in the coming years as the United States rejoins the other Arctic countries in trying to deal with climate and other problems confronting the Arctic. Where are we headed in the long term? I don't know. I don't think anybody does know, but the Arctic has been a peaceful, and relatively stable region for much of the time since the end of the Cold War. If you think of parts of the planet where there is active military conflict underway, it's not happening in the Arctic, or civil war, you know, none of the countries in the Arctic are experiencing that. Um, 
threats of large scale terrorism. No, I don't think that's happening or going to happen in the Arctic either. Mass migrations of people, no. Human trafficking, uh, trafficking of narcotics, other sorts of things, no. The Arctic has been a fairly peaceful place. And with some cool heads, I think we can keep it that way, even if we deal, even as we deal with the challenges we face. Thanks very much for this time. I'm looking forward to hearing questions. We've been getting some fabulous questions, which we're going to get to right now. Uh, uh, and but please keep them coming in. Uh, put a name on them if you can, uh, and your hometown is also helpful. And these are great. They're they're sh they're short and to the point. Um, there, um, maybe David Bolton, you alluded to this, but help us understand something about, you mentioned that, for instance, Canada has a different view about non-Canadian vessels coming through that route, but also Russia has a different view. Um, the issue's been raised, isn't there something about a Russian tariff on commercial shipping? I don't understand that. Does that exist now? Uh, yes, Russia does charge non-Russian vessels for the privilege of sailing through the Northern Sea Route. They do provide icebreaker escorts through that route, and that's part of the justification for that. But the U.S. view implies to the Northwest Passage in Northern Canada as well is that these waters are like the Straits of Gibraltar, the Straits of Malacca. They are international straits, and vessels of any country are free to pass through those. And the coastal states in Russia and Canada, respectively, don't have the right to impose unilaterally costs or regulations. Uh, these are um, such such matters should be negotiated multilaterally. Some of the conference participants were struck when uh, Thomas Nielsen w was telling the story of Russian military activity closer to uh, Norway, but also the B-1s from the U.S. showing up any second now before the conference is over, not at the border with Russia, but closer. Um, here's one of the questions. Ruth from Parkman says, knowing that the Arctic is strategically important for military power, this is from earlier in the session, why aren't Arctic states increasing their military presence as a reaction to this? Now, you mentioned NATO, Thomas, but what about other countries? You think that, uh, uh, in, in other words, here's someone who's wondering why there might not even be a larger reaction from non-Russian countries. Well, there are uh, debated uh, nowadays, uh, especially among uh, the Nordic uh, nations, and uh, and uh, logically because we are the ones that are bordering uh, Russia in in uh, uh, in in the north. Uh, so, but uh, uh, it is always a uh, kind of trying to understand uh, the uh, other side's point of uh, view, and. Uh, it is uh, important to look at the power because Russia want to be a superpower like it was in the Soviet Union, but with conventional weapons, NATO is just so much stronger. And that means that the weight of uh, the nuclear weapons of Russia is becoming more and more and more important. Uh, and uh, for Russia, uh, the nuclear weapons based on their ballistic missile submarines, uh, they are in the north. Uh, and Russia are doing whatever it takes to protect those uh, uh, nuclear uh, ballistic missile submarines in case of a conflict. And that means that they have to expand their activities further south in the Norwegian Ocean, in uh, the so-called area between Greenland, Iceland, and the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, this is also because of uh, new weapon technology. I mean, cruise missiles, they can fly uh, much longer than they could during the Cold War, and uh, they are much more precise. And that uh, means that Russia had to think bigger in a geographical area than they did uh, did before. So uh, the balance for us in the Nordic countries is uh, trying to reassure Russia that uh, we don't have any hostile, we don't want to go to war with uh, with Moscow. Why should we? Uh, so, so that, but, uh, but the fear is, of course, that uh, a conflict other places in the world, in uh, Syria, in Libya, in the Baltics, can have a spillover effect 
that will force Russia to sail out uh, their nuclear uh, weapons uh, in the north. And, and uh, that is the, the situation we are, we are facing uh, today. But other nations, uh, non-NATO nations, uh, they are not uh, uh, military active, uh, except of, uh, of course, uh, Russia uh, and, and uh, Sweden, Finland in, in, in the north. China, for instance, I, I very often I read uh, newspaper headlines that China are planning to uh, be a part of the military power game in the Arctic. No, I never seen any sign of that. There's never been any Chinese Navy vessels up in the north. And I think Mike Pompeo, when he said in, in at the Arctic Council meeting in Rovaniemi uh, one and a half year ago that uh, China is planning for submarine activities in the Arctic now. They are not. They are, they are, there are no Chinese uh, submarines that are designed or have any uh, reasons to sail uh, up north. That was framed as a very military uh, question that I asked. But we have uh, someone who, who asked questions a little broader about Arctic security. Sadie Fowler of Dickinson College. What about the EU's role? Well, how does the EU see its role in Arctic mm -hmm. security? The European Union uh, is a, a, in a very uh, special uh, position there because uh, they are not uh, uh, observers to, to the Arctic Council. They want to be it. But uh, I think that the, the Arctic uh, eight uh, uh, members of, of the, uh, the Arctic uh, Council uh, do not necessarily like to invite the European Union uh, to have a stronger play uh, up north. Uh, for Norway and Canada, uh, obviously, because uh, uh, the European Union uh, was against seal hunting uh, in, in the Arctic, uh, Arctic waters, uh, and, and Norway and Canada didn't want to have uh, uh, the European there for, the, for, the, for that reason. Uh, Norway also, because the European Parliament, uh, the, the uh, Democratic Assembly of the, of the European Union, have actually uh, called for a ban on oil drilling uh, north of the uh, north of the Arctic Circle, and that is not in the interest of uh, uh, neither uh, Russia or or Norway, who are active in in that area. Uh, but the European Union, as such, uh, I, I recently read their new Arctic strategy, and they are coming up with a, yet another one. Uh, they don't see uh, the Union as such as a military or a security player in the north. Uh, they are concerned about the climate changes. Uh, they want to have a say for that reason, for environmental reasons, uh, but not for uh, a, a say in, in a bigger power game between those nations that are already up there. It's interesting looking at the questions here. Uh, Professor Medvedev, this will be first for you. We're going to come back to Thomas with a different version of the question someone else has asked, but a bunch of questions about this. It's not really about the Arctic. Uh, Professor Medvedev, people are wondering about with everything going on in Russia, for instance, Scott Beebe from Milton, Massachusetts wrote this. Are you concerned about your ability to speak frankly in the way that you do? Because we heard your presentation, it did not sound like um, Vladimir Putin's party line just now. So um, uh, how, how are you feeling about your ability to speak freely these days? Oh, well, thanks for the concern. <laughs> well, yeah, it is, it is dangerous, uh, and it has been indeed for the past, um, I would say, seven, eight years. And uh, yes, I can go back to the, you know, once you, uh, when you introduced me, you told me it's detailed about my position. So I had a personal encounter, so to say, with Vladimir Putin back in 2013. And uh, this was this um, episode with the um, uh, Greenpeace uh, uh, Arctic Sunrise boat arrested, and there was like a very agitated discussion in Russian Facebook and Russian social networks. And of course, many people were accusing, you know, Greenpeace of being, you know, the lap dog of the Western corporations, of the Western governments, and uh, they are like, you know, want to take the Arctic. And I made some comments uh, referring to, um, and I strongly still support and endorse this, the Greenpeace initiative started in 2012 uh, called Save the Arctic. And it is about roughly giving, trying to give the Arctic, at least discussing this, the same status as the Antarctica, right? The Antarctic is uh, basically uh, economy-free, military-free, and um, sort of sovereignty-free. It's an international zone 
uh, exclusively uh, reserved for scientific exploration. It's a global public good reserved for humanity, especially not only the Antarctic, but the ozone hole above it. Uh, so, so we have to be very, you know, as a humanity, we have to be very mindful uh, of this and making this an international environmental reserve. So the Greenpeace started a petition, a campaign, which currently last time I checked, I think there were some 12 million people who signed it, um, Save the Arctic, which calls for the same regime for the Arctic, uh, announcing this, uh, like the international waters of the Arctic, uh, free from military activity, free from international shipping, free from oil exploration, and so on, because it is uh, you know, so important for the global climate uh, that we should reserve it for the future generation, for the future of humanity. And I made these comments on Facebook, and, you know, next morning I was proclaimed uh, like the enemy of Russia for this, and Putin commented on this somehow strangely by the laws of um, social networks. This was presented to him at some, you know, high-profile meeting with his party, and um, uh, he called me a moron for this, uh, because also I was a professor at the High School of Economics, uh, which has some kind of a liberal flair, and uh, this was presented, okay, he is the Moscow liberal professor suggesting that, you know, Arctic is taken away from Mother Russia and reserved for the international community, and, and so on. So yeah, so there was some kind of a mm, uh, campaign against me for several months, uh, and uh, there were several attempts uh, to send me to prison for this. Um, uh, luckily, I survived. Actually, they were going on for a number of years. But so say I'm I'm rather a lucky exception in this sense. But I have so many colleagues uh, who have. Uh, you know, lost uh, their profession, who have uh, lost the freedom, who have uh, were compelled to emigrate from Russia. I think we're talking about dozens and dozens of people um, that uh, for just exercising their right of constitutional, the right of free speech, uh, were uh, really, they were persecuted uh, in Russia. So yes, uh, I have to be frank, uh, there is a big, big danger in speaking freely in Russia and in general, you know, for making a contact with any kind of international organization, right? Uh, for in participating in international fora, receiving, you know, a grant or honorarium for, from, uh, from the West, collaborating uh, for the Russian scholars, collaborating with Western scholars. It's really changing very rapidly. Russia 2021, is a very different country, even from Russia 2020, let alone Russia 2018 or Russia before the Crimean annexation, Russia 2013, when I had this uh, uh, confrontation with Putin. So uh, even this episode happened these days, I think uh, I would be in big, I would be in big trouble. So yes, unfortunately, I have to say I'm really happy to be able to communicate and to speak to you. And uh, you know, I'm not concerned about my security, but we have to be concerned about Russia which now after 2020, after the change in the constitution and after um, uh, now after the Navalny poisoning, it's, let, let's call things their proper names. It's a full-fledged dictatorship, right? It's, it's a patented dictatorship, a personal dictatorship. Uh, we're talking about you no know, front of Spain. We're talking about Pinochet you know, Chile. We're talking about, you know, maybe Latin American comparisons, but you know, the problem is it has nuclear missiles. It's here at the edge of Europe. And um, yeah, uh, and we're just in the middle of it. And frankly, I don't see an easy way to change this. And I think we have to stay with this for years and years to come. And a, a corollary question, I think, to Thomas Nielsen. It's from Ed Warren from West Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, do you have details of tensions of editorial freedoms in covering the Arctic? I mean, you must run into something there, Thomas. Oh, every day. Every day we run into into something, and uh, and uh, uh, the, this is a follow up of what uh, Sergei uh, just said. Uh, Russia 2021 is a very very different place than the Russia 2020. Uh, the Barnes Observer, we are bilingual. We we publish in both English and in Russian language, and we have done that for 20 years because we we think that. Uh, Cross-border journalism is the key uh, for soft security, for uh, lowering tensions, for avoiding misunderstandings. 
So it has always been a principle of, of the Barnes Observer uh, to publish in Russian language. And we started with that long before Google Translate could, could help uh, anyone. And we are doing it uh, still. Uh, and for that particular reason, uh, and also because we have highlighted uh, the groups that are not having a kind of uh, open door uh, to Russian state media, like the Greenpeace with the Prila Slomnoye platform, like human rights organizations, like other environmental groups, youth organizations, and so on. We have given them uh, space. We are interviewing them. We are highlighting their point of view, uh, which is, of course, quite natural in journalism. And for that very reason, uh, the Barnes Observer is today the only Nordic media that is blocked by the censorship wall in uh, Russia. So if you are sitting in Moscow or in the Norilsk or in Vladivostok or in Murmansk, you can't read the Barnes Observer unless you use uh, Vitrol Private Network, the, the uh, VPN. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we find that very disturbing because we, we think that uh, covering uh, issues of the Arctic, like if there is an oil spill somewhere uh, along the Siberian coast, uh, we think it's very important to cover that. We think it's very important to raise uh, the voices of those uh, who are not on the front cover of uh, Moscow media uh, every, every day. So, but we, we are blocked uh, and we have been so for uh, one and a half year now. So we are into a kind of daily fight with uh, Russia's censorship agency, the Roskomnadzor. We have taken them to court. Uh, of course, we lost the court, we lost uh, the city court, we lost the Supreme Court, uh, but we think that it is very important to use legal uh, means uh, to fight censorship to fight uh, authoritarianism, uh, or as Sergei called it, uh, nearly dictatorships. Uh, so, and uh, our recent move, because we, we are very, very small compared with the Kremlin. Of course, we, 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 it's, uh, it's a David with, uh, with Goliath. Mm -hmm. But what we have done now, which they have not managed to stop in our journalism, is so that we are uh, having a podcast that are reading our uh, Russian news every day, uh, and which are published on uh, on uh, uh, SoundCloud and uh, Spotify and all these uh, different channels uh, that the Russian censorship agency can't uh, stop because we think it's so important uh, to keep journalism free and independent. Hey, just by the way, don't spend too much time on this, but I mean, you're not blocked in Norway, but you did take yourself, your organization, you uh, made yourself much more independent some years ago. Uh, uh, you've also, you know, worked to be sure you could be candid even within Norway. Yeah, we uh, for uh, for a few years we shared the office with our regional uh, secretariat here in uh, working on cross border uh, issues. But uh, politicians uh, found it uh, too hard to support uh, free and independent journalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they wanted to take away our editorial freedom. Uh, that is totally unacceptable for us. So we moved away from this governmental funded uh, office and we started the Barnes Observer as, a, to, as it is today, a, a journalist owned free and independent media publishing in Russian language and in English but uh, unfortunately not with any governmental uh, funding. So, but we are doing very well, we survive and we have a long-term uh, plan for our journalism in the, in the high north. Uh, James Curtis raises an issue, he's from Camden, Maine. I'll start with David, we'll go to Sergey. Um, we talked about oil, oil's tough in the Arctic uh, and, and heaven forbid we get a spill. But we didn't talk about liquefied natural gas. Will Russian development of natural gas and European markets for this gas give Russia the economic means to continue oil exploration and extraction um, you know, in these areas? Uh, you know, it's true that with oil, the price has been low, that it takes the economic incentive away currently. And look at natural gas these days. But what about, I mean, look at, uh, and look at the price of natural gas as well. But Dave, what do you think? I mean, there is more vigor in developing Arctic gas resources, right? Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. In fact, Russia has expanded liquid, liquefied natural gas facilities, including on the Amal Peninsula. Um, I forget whether Thomas or Sergei mentioned that the following the uh, invasion of Crimea and the Western sanctions that ensued, 
Uh, that development does not take place with the support of Western companies and Western money, but China has come in to sort of fill that void. And there are uh, large scale Chinese investments, including in Yumal, uh, liquefied natural gas. And yes, there is a market for this, not only in Europe, but also in, in Asia, of course, including in China. Um, and so one perhaps unintended consequence of the sanctions has been to push Russia and China closer together, at least in this respect. Uh, the people I've talked to in Russia say that the investment model is not actually to their liking, and there are quite a lot of frictions in the relationship um, that have resulted, and yet Russia doesn't really have a choice at this point. I'd be curious to watch where that goes. I wonder if Sergei may have a different take on this, though. What do you think, sir? Oh, I, I, I concur. Uh, I think oh, gas obviously has a bigger future in general in terms of hydrocarbons. I think oil is like passé. Uh, gas has uh, much more chance. And uh, But I think the, the point uh, is it's about LNG. Uh, so the Arctic gas and uh, the supply to the Western markets is about liquidified but, uh, natural gas. But um, another point is that Russia does not yet have the technology itself to build an LNG plant. It's still critically dependent on Western investment. Uh, and I think in the conditions of the sanctions, and I think we are entering the new age of sanctions against Russia with Navalny affair, with the current Russian developments, uh, this has to be really factored in. I like seeing the problems with Nord Stream too. So I think any kind of new gas stories uh, will be facing significant difficulties as well. But that's true that it has a bigger future than gas and it will out uh, than oil and it will outslice in like in this stage of the energy uh, world energy, so to say, supply, it will outlast oil by you know, like a decade, a couple of decades. I'm gonna ask one more. We got a bunch of great questions, but we could also I'm harvesting these for the session that we do after the break, because you'll still be with us. And uh, but here's here's one. Uh, Sergey, it's it it's uh, focuses in on a, a core of your presentation about the symbolic. You try to make the case about the the symbolic value of the Arctic from the Russian perspective, um, but some people are slightly wanting to know more about it, uh, or, or 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 push back slightly about you know symbolism is also has real effects. Um, here's one from I may not get the pronunciation quite right. She's from Boston University. Adriana Krasiun is the best I can do. Uh, Canada is also engaged in intensely symbolic sovereignty exercises and claims on uh, the legacy of British exploration. Apparently, there are some wrecks, Erebus and Terror. I don't know about these. Uh, in Russia's case, can you speak about how these symbolic Arctic projections of sovereignty work internally versus externally? Um, I, I guess it's a question also about... Um, about how you evaluate the power of using this kind of sim symbolism politically? Yes, of course, it's um, a very good question. And of course, it's uh, critically important uh, for domestic discourse. Um, one thing has to be factored in the Arctic is like Putin's personal crusade. He has a few points in, with which he is really concerned, and one uh, is the Arctic. Basically, you have to understand, I mean, his self-perception in the Russian history, and he really, he thinks of himself already for, like, for the past 15 years at least, as, you know, one of the big uh, men of Russian history, on the par with Peter the Great, uh, with Ivan the Terrible, and so on. He really sees himself this way. So he sees himself as the man who has um, sort of healed the Russian uh, ressentiment. The man who stopped the big breakup, which occurred in the end uh, of uh, the 20th century, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and then, you know, the ensuing a decade of shame, the 1990s, when Russia was, like, as they say, standing on its knees, and he is the man who brought Russia back from her knees, and then he is the collecting the Russian lands as the big, uh, the Moscow princess, Ivan III, uh, Vasily III did, who was, uh, was say, collecting the lands around Moscow. So he's, uh, he sees himself as the collector of lands. So we saw Crimea, we might see Belarus eventually. They're, they're talking some talk about, you know, North Kazakhstan. Well, God save us from this development. And the Arctic is 
is one of these things. So he is very sensitive about uh, Russia's control of the Arctic. So, and I think the Arctic is going to be the next big thing in the Russian propaganda in the coming years. Because, uh, so to say, the Crimean champagne, you know, bubbles are out, and all public poll data say this. Uh, it has expired. The Crimea no longer gives the steam, the propaganda steam for the regime. Uh, so they need some new big idea. And the next big idea is probably going to be the Arctic. And of course, it will be mostly felt in the Russian domestic politics and the domestic discourse uh, and new repressive laws on, you know, infringement of sovereignty, criticizing sovereignty, questioning Russian sovereignty, and um, uh, stuff like this. Uh, we might see some, you know, espionage cases of somebody, you know, disclosing uh, the Russian uh, oil fields or, you know, military bases and so on. They so much like this sort of, you know, fake espionage cases. And, um, and so on. So Arctic is a big uh, disciplinary instrument, I have to say, in the, in the Russian domestic discourse. And of course, it plays uh, in the domestic scene. And it is sort of, you know, it's um, like win-win game for the, for the political elite. It's undisputable. It's something sacred. You know, for centuries, the Arctic discourse has acquired this, um, you know, sense of uh, sanctity because it is uh, like, like the war. You know, our forefathers died for it. You know, we've spent centuries of Russian history, you know, developing it. So no criticism can be justified, right? Uh, it's uh, a um, state of emergency, right? Because it's also like one big extended Russian border zone, one big extended Russian sovereignty zone. So you cannot be putting questions to this. Environment-wise, military-wise, budget-wise, it's like one big black hole. So we have to be pumping resources into this, and we don't have to. We don't have the right to ask questions about it because it's one big state emergency, one big state necessity of the Arctic. So yes, it's uh, in a sense uh, for the domestic discourse, it uh, really feeds into this uh, authoritarian uh, trends. All right, we have to unfortunately leave it there because there's a lot more to say. But everyone's coming back.